Winter Roses, Summer by Fairy Tale Lover. Chapter 18 Inheritance. Daenerys walked into John's dressing room, where he and Patrick moved about packing for the trip. Patrick, may I have a moment with my lord husband? Of course, my lady, the servant said and left the room. What is that? John asked, nodding towards the package she carried. Well, I learned I were working on something. And then after the jeweller came, I ordered a little something. That sounds expensive, John said, though he was smiling and there was no censure in his tone. Daenerys laughed. Well, you spoil me with enough gifts. I thought it was time I gave back, she said, setting the package atop the table. You know, I remember a scene like this. Our first kiss, Danny said fondly. It's much nicer to not be freezing this time around. John laughed as he opened the package, and his sense of deja vu was increased. It was a sword belt, complete with a scabbard. His first sword belt. The one she'd given him on his 14th name day. The day of their first kiss. But this time, it was no longer plain leather. There were winter roses embroidered on it, and there was a sword encased in the scabbard. Is that... Well, we had something to embroider on it this time. And I figured that if your purpose is to raise interest in the Winter Diamond, you should have a bigger sample than what you're taking for Sansa and Arya. I talked with the armourer, and he made you a new sword. And then he worked with the jeweller to have the gem carved into a winter rose and set into the pommel. According to the jeweller, a rock of this size and work to that format will show people the gem is malleable but extremely resistant. It would increase the value greatly. Look at you, John said with a huge smile. A proper businesswoman. Why? Danny played along. Did you think I was only going to sit by the fire knitting? John threw back his head in loud laughter and hugged her as tightly as her huge baby bump allowed. God forbid! You'd be utterly boring. I prefer you much like this, my fierce dragon princess. John bit back a laugh as he watched Sam come up on the deck of the Lady Daenerys. He was still pale and even looked a bit thinner. Puking and not eating for 12 days had clearly taken its toll on him. I can see you laughing inside. Sam grumbled. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. John said, truly apologetic, but you do look funny. You're a terrible friend. We'll get there tomorrow morning. The captain just told me. Thank the gods. If you don't mind, I won't make too many trips outside home. <clears throat> I mean, Sam blushed and cleared his throat. Outside of your lands. Home, Sam. John said with a smile. His heart warming at the thought of his castle could be home. I may be lord of the lands, but it's our home. They both smiled. For two people who never truly belonged in places they lived in, regardless of the family surrounding them, the feeling of home was sweet and heartwarming. And that gave John an idea. John had to admit that the capital was quite impressive. The tall structure of the Red Keep growing above the rest as they made their way to the gate. Sam's cheeks were even flushed. A smile spread across his face now that they were in dry land. Though how anyone could withstand this smell was beyond him. Any idea how many people live here? John asked one of his guards. I'd say about half a million, my lord. Raylos, the captain of the guard, said. That's the last census I saw. And I doubt the number's grown too much in the past two years. John nodded, deep in thought. Uncle Benjamin had selected him to accompany John because the man had served in the city watch and would therefore be familiar with the layout of King's Landing. That's a whole lot of people, all crammed into that. Why would anyone want to live like that? He asked. There's more work in the city, my lord. The guard answered with a small shrug. More safety, too. Then why did you leave? Sam asked, ever curious. If you don't mind me asking. I was paid to patrol the city and protect the citizens. But things get dangerous for those of us who don't want to get paid to close our eyes. John snorted, understanding what went unsaid. Anyone offers that while in my employ? Come to me. I won't tolerate dishonesty, and I reward loyalty, he said to all five men surrounding him. The men nodded, 
and John could see the growing respect in their eyes. He still found it weird, having men escorting him, men obeying him, but he supposed there was nothing to be done to help it. He was shocked to see their surroundings once they crossed the mud gate. He had seen poverty, especially near the time of the summer snows. But this... This was pure misery. And this is not even Flaybottom, my lord, Raylos said. The city slum. John watched a few children huddle around the trash can of a tavern. They all had the hungry look he'd seen sometimes in the mirror, when Lady Catelyn would block his access to the kitchens. Theirs were obviously deeper. More intense. Leeds, buy them each a meal, please, he told the guard next to Sam. The guard nodded and pulled his horse from the formation to go and speak to the tavern keeper. Be careful with those, my lord, Raylos cautioned. You start being too kind and you'll attract the wrong kind of attention. I won't see a child starving, John stated strongly. I know their pain and I will help it as much as I can. None of their guards said anything. To the Tower of the Hand then, my lord, Raylos asked. Yes, my lord father will either be there or at court. And I'd rather not interrupt his work so suddenly. Raylos nodded, though his half-smile showed he understood the real reason. I heard they'll be hosting a tournament in honour of your Lord Father's appointment as hand, my lord. I think we made it just in time. I bet my Lord Father love that, John said with a chuckle. They continued in relative silence across the city and up Aegon's high hill. Raylos's knowledge proved to be invaluable, even if they could see the Red Keep from afar, as the guard took them straight to the Tower of the Hill. Lord Stark is attending a small council meeting, my lord, said Jory Cassell when they dismounted. Your sisters are in the gardens with the Queen. Perhaps you should wash before going to rescue them. John snorted, but took the advice anyway. From a distance, he saw that while Sansa seemed somewhat interested in what Cersei Lannister was saying, Arya was only very poorly disguising her boredom. As she looked around the gardens, she was the first one to see their approach. John! she exclaimed, jumping out of her chair and running over. John caught her and lifted her into a hug. What are you doing here? Can I come and visit my two beautiful sisters? Yes, please! Arya laughed. The father never said anything. I wanted to make a surprise. So secretive, Lord Starling. People might wonder why. Cersei said, having walked over with Sansa and a handful of women. Not secretive at all, Your Grace. I wouldn't have come in a ship flying my banners and walked down to the palace gardens to meet with the Queen upon arrival. I merely found myself with business to attend to in the capital. Cersei smiled falsely. You just never mentioned a visit. We did part ways just a few moon turns ago. Some business came up once I turned my attention to my lands. I could hardly waste time inspecting my keep when hosting the royal family. You are more deserving of company. Cersei lost her smile at the needling. Well, I wish you good fortune on your business. I should leave you to talk. Doubtless you will rush back north to your wife. We can resume our tour later, girls. We will have more than enough time. The Queen rushed away, her handmaidens following closely. John put Arya down and Sansa came up to hug him. Is it true? Or do you have some other reason to be here? She said, You're too smart, John chuckled. Nothing for you girls to concern yourselves with. And how is Bran? Arya asked. We got Rob's raven, he woke up. Let your brother breathe, girls, Ella said fondly. Why don't we go back to the tower before you can resume your pestering? I agree. John chuckled. What's with the interrogation, huh? Come on, I've been on a tower for a fortnight. I'm starving for a good meal and decent company. They went back to the tower, where the servants had already laid out luncheon. They sat down to eat, and John took boxes from Raylos had brought in his things. Found some interesting things on my land, so I got you two a gift. Father said you found mines, Sansa said, accepting her box with a smile. I did, and I hope you will like it. There's two in there. One is for your name day. Sansa smiled and opened the box, gasping as she saw inside. John, they're beautiful! She stood up, crossed the table and hugged him strongly. I thought you'd like something that you can wear every day. Better than a dainty necklace that's bound to stay in a cupboard for years. John said, and she laughed, taking the first necklace out. It was made of silver, and the pendant was Sansa's favourite dragonfly. But then, living in court, you need the dainty necklace anyway. 
The girl smiled as she fingered the bigger necklace. The one that would only be suitable for balls and special occasions. What gem is this? she asked. I don't think I've ever seen or heard of it. The miner and the jeweller I hired don't know either, John said, standing up to help her clasp the dragonfly necklace on. But Danny thought we should call it the Winter Diamond. Well, Aria laughed. It does have the same colour as Winter Roses, which are your sigil after all. John chuckled, giving Aria her box. She narrowed her eyes. I know you don't care for jewellery, but you are living in court now. You should dress the part a little bit. She sighed and opened the box, fighting back a smile, but finally giving in to the blue-eyed silver diabolf. Only you could get me to wear jewellery. I promise not to tell anyone, John laughed. After luncheon, Ella called Sansa to her embroidery lesson, but Arya refused to go. John raised an eyebrow when the woman didn't insist. Father told her not to force me, Arya explained. He still thinks I'll marry a lord and have his children, but at least he lets me... Oh, I never told you. He let me keep Needle. Who did? He came to my room when I was practicing, Arya explained, blushing. But he let me keep it and said that if I have a sword, I should know how to use it. He hired a tutor, a bravosi man, Sirio Farrell, and he's teaching me the water dance. Really? Oh, that I'd like to see. Arya pulled him by the hand. Come on, we can practice before father comes home. John laughed, letting his sister lead him into an open terrace and taking the wooden practice sword from her hand. Ned frowned as he walked into the tower of the hand that evening. There was a raucous laughter and dull thuds that indicated Arya was practising with her wooden swords. However, the tutor was not due today, and he could hear Sansa laughing. But where would Sansa be watching Arya's lesson? Because he highly doubted Sansa was practising with Arya. I yield! I yield! I yield! His youngest daughter yelled, then laughed loudly. Curious, Ned quickly climbed the stairs and smiled even as he was surprised. John was tickling Arya, who was trying to escape his hug. Sansa, Sam and Ella sat nearby, laughing and clapping. Warmth filled the Lord's heart. So it seems we have a guest, he said, drawing attention to himself. Arya ran to him, hugging him beyond excited. Ned hadn't seen her this happy since the day she'd gotten Nymeria. Not even when he had hired her tutor. And he somehow felt as if the madness that had surrounded his family for months now had finally lifted. Sorry, father, John said. We got carried away. Nonsense, Ned said, setting Arya down. It's been a while since I've seen so many smiles. I'd forgotten how nice it is. Look what John gave me, father, Sansa said, coming closer and pointing to her necklace. Ned smiled. Wow, I hope you thanked your brother. Of course I did, Sansa said, a bit offended. And I got this one, Arya said, pointing to her own necklace. John says Danny named the gem the Winter Diamond. It's a beautiful gem. Ned chuckled. Go get washed up for supper then, girls. He waited until they were gone. Well, I'm very glad of the company. I doubt you came all the way here just to give those necklaces. Ned said as he and John hugged. I wish I could say yes, John said, sneaking a look around. I'll go check on the girls, Ella said, taking the hint. Ned exhaled as John pulled the dagger from his pocket, explaining where he'd gotten it. This is Valyrian steel. Ned said, looking at the blade. Yes, and it's as sharp as ice. John explained, it cut Lady Catelyn's fingers nearly to the bone. Ned looked up from the dagger. Lady, what was Catelyn doing there? How did she get there? Rob didn't tell you? John asked, frowning, and Ned shook his head. Odd, I saw him writing a raven. The bird must have gotten lost. What is Catelyn doing at the Midnight Fortress? She was worried about Brown, father. Danny let her stay. Ned clenched his jaw. Daenerys is most magnanimous. But I'll send a raven. Tell your brother to send her back to Riveron. She's seen Bran. She has no more business in your home. Not after everything she's done. Well, you won't hear me complaining, John muttered. In any case, we didn't trust ravens or riders to bring this or our words. Rob wanted to come, but I thought it would be better if I did. Whose dagger is this? Well, that's a dagger I haven't seen in a while, said a new voice. Ned and John turned to the entrance. Sir Barristan, Ned greeted. What can I help you with? I'm sorry to intrude, Lord Stark, 
But your men said I could find you here. King Robert sent me. Queen Cersei told him of Lord Starling's arrival, and his grace said he'd like to repay the hospitality in the Midnight Fortress. He insists you, Lord Starling, and your daughters come to supper tonight. We would be delighted, Ned said, and though he wished he could say otherwise. John held back his groan, aware that there was no way to refuse it. You said you know who this dagger belongs to, sir. Sir Barristan Selmy, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. I don't know whom it belongs to currently, or whom it belonged to just before you got it, Lord Starling. But I know who owned it originally. How many times did I not see it on his belt, I wonder? Who? Oh, John insisted, interrupting his reverie. I'm speaking to Barristan Selmy. The bold, his inner child thought. I do know so I am. Rhaegar Targaryen, the knight said, and Ned froze. It was his. He had it with him when he rode into the Battle of the Trident. After he told me... Well, it doesn't matter what he said. It's... I went to look, but after the prince fell, but I didn't find it. Someone must have gotten to it before me. It is Valyrian steel. The man looked at the blade. If you'll forgive my curiosity, my lord, but where did you... Thank you for the information and the invitation, Sir Barristan. Ned said, his panic rising. He needed to end the conversation now. John, show him out as I tell your sisters of our change in plans. Lord Stark, Sir Barristan called, looking at John. My prince told me what was in the tower. I have always known. Your prince, you say? Ned clenched his jaw, his anxiety taking over again. No, it can't be. He wouldn't have kept quiet. He wouldn't have bent the knee to Robert if he knew the heir. He stopped himself again. I vowed to serve who sits on the Iron Throne. Barristan lowered his voice. It doesn't change who I think of as my king. Now I ask you to trust me, as I have trusted you for the past sixteen years. Ned felt his heart falter. He had been so consumed with grief and worry over those who were at the Tower of Joy, He'd never even stopped to think about who Rhaegar might have told. John frowned, feeling like he was missing a key part of the conversation. Lord Starling, where did you find the dagger? Barristan insisted. Ned nodded, and John felt even more confused as he spoke. Someone was sent to kill my little brother. The knife was found on the cat's paw's corpse. Barristan clenched his jaw. Did you do it? I wasn't there. Luckily for the man. Or perhaps unluckily. My brother's direwolf claimed the rescue. The knight smiled, amused. You should keep the dagger, my lord. No, it's... Sir Barristan is right, Ned said, biting back a sigh. If it's anyone's, it's yours. Why mine? John frowned. If anyone's, it would be... The assassin was sent to your home, Lord Starling. Sir Barristan said, it's your claim as Lord of the Midnight Fortress. John thought it odd, but accepted it and placed the dagger on his belt. He couldn't deny that the blade had an excellent balance, and felt right on his hip. I'll go get your sisters, Ned said. How is Lady Starling? Sir Barrison asked. I hear only the loveliest things about her. She is lovely, thank you. Expecting our first child. Well, my congratulations. My best wishes to you, your wife and your children. May your family prosper. John was getting only more and more confused. They got to the courtyard where several of the guards were lounging about, the banners with his sigils stuck in the grass. Sir Barristan looked at them with a smile. Winter roses. When I heard, I didn't believe it. John frowned. What is it with the winter roses? Why does it matter that we chose it? Why did it offend the king? Robert was upset, was he? <laughs> Sir Barristan chuckled. Yes, I suppose he would be. Winter roses are flowers from the north, Lord Starling. They don't exist down here. Not naturally, at least. Once, one such rare flower rode south, and everyone fell in love. Some say that the winter rose represents more than just beauty. Its stubbornness of persevering when no one else would have thought it possible. And their beauty imposes its presence, drawing all eyes and hearts. You chose wisely. Your father would be proud of you. Before John could do more than blink at the choice of the tents, the knight left, walking away quickly, 
what just happened? John thought. What is it? Ella asked, seeing Ned coming down the corridor as she left Sansa's room. He was agitated and worried, which in turn concerned her. Ned clenched his jaw, took a deep breath and pointed his head towards the end of the corridor, urging her to follow him up to his solar. Inside, he exhaled, passing his hands through his head to clear the anxiety. He sat at his desk. Ella barred the door, seeing that it would be a private conversation and checking the servants' door for little ears. She then stepped up to the desk, leaning against it, and pulled his hands out of his hair, pulling his chin up so he could face her. Tell me. Sir Barristan knows, he confessed with a deep sigh. He knows. Oh, you mean... He said Rogar told him. Did he threaten you? No, rather. He asked me to trust him as he has trusted me for the past 16 years. Trusting you to protect? Yes. Ella took a deep breath, organising her thoughts. That changed the scenario a little bit. Who had Rhaegar told? Who, at this moment, right now, knew of a truth that could unravel the Baratheon dynasty? Why had they kept silent for 16 years? Why bring it up now? What is he going to do about it? She asked. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. All he says is that he knew and that I should trust him. Why now? I'm here now. John and Daenerys are married now. Who knows? I know you'd rather bury the past. It's better off buried. Is it better off for whom? She asked and he got the impression she meant it rhetorically. You're not the only one who is in possession of the facts, Ned. You've always known that. Too many people know. Maybe. But I think you're forgetting one little detail. Their silence. Why did they keep silent so far? Why is Viserys Targaryen making his moves in now of all times? So Barristan won't be involved. He said he knew the truth, which means he knows who is the rightful heir to the throne. He wouldn't be tangled up in a scheme involving Viserys Targaryen calling himself the third of his name. You're not in self-imposed exile in Winterfell anymore, Ned. Ella declared and he glared at her. You're in the capital. You're in the great game. You have to figure out who the players are and what are their motives. I hate politics. Hate them all you like, but be careful or they'll swallow you whole. Ned exhaled strongly. Blasted be the day Robert declared war. I need to know whom Rhaegar might have told, he said. Ella smirked, anticipating what was to come next. Can you write to him? Ned asked, blushing. Of course I can. I'll get a kick out of it. You know that. I know, Ned sighed. He warned me this would come back to haunt me, and I ignored him. You two can laugh about it now. I'll write to him, she said with a smile, knowing they would laugh about it. Don't worry, even before his answer, I already know it's a short list. Rhaegar was being very careful. I'd rather it was non-existent. Stop whining, Ned. It's been 16 years and no one has made a move. It's doubtful there is much danger now. Ned grimaced as he watched her go. She was right, of course, and he knew her letter would bring back words of mocking he'd rather not hear and that she wouldn't spare him the full letter instead of giving him only the names. And he had to go and face a formal dinner with Robert. They had never really patched up their friendship. Cersei and possibly Jamie Lannister. His head was throbbing again. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that one. Oh ho ho, intrigue. I like this. So Barristan knows. John's being sweet with his sisters. And Ella is getting Ned to actually play the game rather than be played in it, which I, I appreciate. And the next chapter promises to be interesting. So let's see how it goes, shall we? Anyway, you guys know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, guys and I'm Bino Pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.